Okay, dribbles the all knowing cat. Is this a book? Is this a yes. books? Um, YouTube videos? Okay. Is it a, a real cat? Or is it an animation? What, an animation or a real? No cat. Is it a book? Fantastic. Is that a bunch of uh huh. Is animation? Is it just bad video? Yeah. I remember the world coin books. Jeez, and books. That's awesome. Is there a specific thing that Bernie emphasizes? It's just about like teaching kids stuff. Like, you always take them to the zoo, teach them how to count, teach them how to color, and all that. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah. Right now, we're getting to the scene where mm -hmm. it's neat. So, we're starting to film everything on the scene. So, uh, uh, Lloyd and I were just talking about that. I have a nonprofit called STEM Story, mm -hmm. and that is to encourage um, girls to stay interested in STEM as they go through their like 11 to 17 year old mm -hmm. selves. So, I spent a lot of time actually did the last two weekends live events with uh, girls in STEM. Our goal is, Troy, is to take um, girls who have an interest in STEM and pair them up and let them meet. A female professional STEM person. Right. And once they kind of get that, once they see somebody, especially if they see somebody that looks like them, right. then they're okay. Yeah, it could be her. I agree. Mean, she's beautiful and elegant right. and making, you know, making mm -hmm. good money and all. So it's amazing what works, how it works, mm -hmm. you know, and how important it is. I believe that. Yeah. I really do. I believe that. Sports are <laughs> Is that sports? Sports? Most people aspire to be yeah. like guys. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. You know, the, uh, this dispensation, we totally changed. Yeah. And we asked for a still book as a matter of fact. Did you apply that to all of these guys? You know, kids. You know, I'm going to let you buy three to buy more. That's that mom. Yeah. Because I'm doing illustration now. Okay. So the book is done. Uh, but I'm here to work towards uh, zero to six. Zero to six. Yeah. That's what I'm here to do because I understand the personality is set at six. And some kids, you can catch them there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, then of course, their minds are already going to be geared to you. Like, there is no way trying to change your mind, trying to convince them. I'm not doing any of that. You know, so, what we, so where, here's our, our focus. At age 11, 12, girls. Like STEM better than boys. They're good at math, they're good at yes. science, they love it. Yes. And I meet them and they're right. they're fired up. But then by the time they get to college age at 17, that drops off to like 12%. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because they look out in the world and they say, Well, I'm interested in science. I don't know, like, well, my daughter. So it started with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And my daughter came home with her SAT scores and she cried. And I said, Why are you crying? And she showed them to me, and she was like top 5% in math in the nation. Mm -hmm. Why is that a bad thing? She said, Well, what, what good is math? Oh, you're going to be a math teacher? Right. And I'm like, No, honey, this the world of possibilities, and it starts out, and she's like, Like what? <laughs> I said, I, you know, I don't know. Or we lived in Boston. I said, I don't know. Because I'm not a I'm not a creative. I'm not a STEM. And uh, I said, <laughs> I said, uh, we lived in Boston. I said, I don't know how to find out. Right. And we called the, the chair of the math department of Brandeis, mm -hmm. told her the story about Sasha. And she said, Come see me. Mm -hmm. So we went out and met that woman. And uh, she she showed me a picture for Sasha. You know, the good mark, we're going to change the world. We're going to be an right. astronaut. We're going right. back on and on and on. And then Sasha was convinced, I was convinced. And then that lady gave us a, a sheet with 20 women's names in robotics and marine biology and all these other things. Mm -hmm. And she said, these women are expecting you to call. Mm -hmm. I've already called them and told them you're coming to see them. Mm -hmm. And so for the next couple of weeks, we'd get on the subway every day after school and we'd go meet these remarkable women. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Sasha's now an adult. And, and the other day I had lunch with her and I said, tell me about that moment for you, what I felt like. And she said, you ever have a moment in your life where you turn a corner and you realize you'll never be like that way, you're always going to be that way? Mm -hmm. She said, I was just, that opened up the world to me. Mm -hmm. And she said, I was thinking that math was actually a liability instead of a, a net asset. And she said, I walked away from there and said, oh my gosh, the world was open to me. Mm -hmm. I could be a Now, 
the adult son, she is a PhD from uh, Emory University, and she's a sociologist, and she does really complex math. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm a crazy person. Right, right, right. Math, right? Yeah. Anyway, so when these girls, and especially if you put uh, a black girl in front of this black center professional, if you put somebody that's uh, handicapped in front of a person in a wheelchair who's a center professional, yeah. then they go, oh, I get it now. Because mm -hmm. most scientists on TV and in the movies are males. If you if we ask any group of people to draw a doctor, mm -hmm. everybody draws a white male doctor. Mm -hmm. And so they just don't see themselves. But what you need, mm -hmm. you know, Rachel, you do that. <coughs> Rachel's a uh, great guy who works at SCI, um, a black man, and he um, he brings his daughter, his granddaughter, to all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, this little tiny girl, we had a from um, from from the Air Force, we had this lady that is a, an urban planner, and she is just everything. Mm -hmm. She is just, she looks like the lady that uh, played Phyllis Phyllis with Shot mm -hmm. on the Cosby Show. Mm -hmm. She looks like that. Mm -hmm. It's elegant and beautiful and super, super smart. Mm -hmm. And when that, when the gracious granddaughter met her, the light came on. You just mm -hmm. see that, that, that her, she'll be changed forever. Yeah, I agree. So, anyway, that's what I'm doing. What is so cool about those math and you brought up a really good point? People don't understand. One thing about math that I love so much mm -hmm. is not about what you can be, because math doesn't lie. Yeah. Everything else in the world lies. The yeah. numbers don't lie. Let me, let me share this with you. I went in Natasha. I did a story with her. And she was in Panama, her and her family, not Panama City, but Panama country. Mm -hmm. And um, when Noriega or whoever, anyway, the political system upheaval mm -hmm. overnight, and her dad was suddenly at risk of being arrested because he's a politician from the old system, mm -hmm. the new system. Mm -hmm. And so they got on the plane in the middle of the night and flew to America. And she said, I didn't know the traditions, I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. But she said she went in math, the math class. Mm -hmm. And she excelled at math because that was the one language that wasn't yeah, made to her. It's, it's one centimeter off, and the building's going to crash you down. Yeah. Just one centimeter. It'll be smaller than a centimeter. Yeah. And the bridge goes crashing down. It, it, it shall make that to 15 years. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be made of a bad or math or a number. Yeah. Or a math or a number. So, as I said, math is numbers. Yeah. Or anything. Yeah. You know, it's like something. Numbers, math, you know, I respect, I can't do math, don't get me wrong. But I respect it. Yeah. I don't have any amount of math person at all, but I just love it because what it does make sense. It doesn't keep a lot. It is a lot. Anything, everybody, everything lies. The math and numbers never lie. Anything? Because they have to be put to a test. Every math promise is put to a test. And that's what I love it so much. Yes, sir. Yeah, we um, got the folks online, and um, so we can. Um, Kind of go ahead and get, get started. I'll, I'll make sure we. Do you introduce me? Right, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just get up and yell. Yeah. <laughs> no, come on. Yeah, I like to come by your reward. Your time. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, just go, right? Yes. Okay, do you like Yeah, we yeah, go. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. I'm Lloyd Bouchard, and this is Daniel Pennington, and we got Carlos here uh, uh, in the audience. Not Carlos, we got <laughs> Troy. <laughs> uh, Carl Carlos is in the audience out uh, on Hopkins, so we're glad to have you. Uh, we are also glad to have those watching out on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. I, I'm excited about today because, you know, this is a, about how you learn how to tell your your story, a uh, picture idea, or your story. So I really appreciate the folks that sign in on online. And so the with Startup on the Blocks, so um, we, we actually try to get people connected to resources. Uh, and we hold weekly events and, and help you learn the best practices. And we also do uh, networking on a weekly basis just so you can meet people and, and share your idea. And, and try to get moving, moving forward. And that, that's important because uh, when it comes to pitching, that's, that's how you actually recruit your team. That's how you uh, 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 
get in a uh, an accelerator program. That's how you get it. You know, uh, win a pitch competition to win win money, and and so the, it's it's the foundation for getting the help you need to build to build your startup. So uh, I can tell you, it made a big difference for me uh, with our cognitive big data systems. You know, I was able to get tens of thousands of dollars in free resources just on the ability to pitch pitch my idea. Thanks to this guy right here, you know, he he um, after the training I had with him, uh, I I went before an audience of about six over six hundred people, and people came up to me and said, "I really finally understand what you're doing," and that was that was really dramatic. And then from that, I got. I got invited to speak at another major event, and um, so it, it just makes a difference when you can articulate what you're what you're doing. And I also went on to win like a twenty five thousand dollar pitch competition, and uh, I, I pitched my ideas to uh, uh, accelerator program over in Poland, and was able to uh, get in that accelerator program, and you know talk, took home almost fifty thousand dollars from that. And I also pitched uh, my idea to uh, British Petroleum Company and, uh, and uh, Avis Budget and IBM. And that lent me another, you know, almost forty thousand dollars. So it's just all about the ability to pitch your idea. And so you, this is why today is so important. So, uh, so Dan, you you actually uh, do this pitch stuff for. You know, training for living, living for the five companies, etc. So we're we're really fortunate to uh, have you have you here. And so uh, you told me a story once. Uh, uh, Jason Crawford. Yes. Yeah, you, you actually helped help him with pitching um, how to pitch the the Iris uh, companies, the local company. And from that training, they uh, Iris with that company. Got nine billion dollars in seed, seed funding. It was the only company that, that this event went to that uh, got a standing ovation. So that, that's how important pitching is. So I hope that's not too strong. Man. No, <laughs> <laughs> it just it just occurs to me that a lot of people won't be a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> Pissed off, I was, I was like, <laughs> 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 iteration after iteration, 
And believe it, believe it or not, I really, uh, and when I went over to Poland and, you know, and, and did that project over there, the, the guys in the audience, you know, they just told me, you get all that technical stuff, just just talk talk about, you know, um, what your product or service does in the benefit of it. So the minute I started, I stopped talking about any of the technical stuff, man, and it, it made, made it really, really good. So, well, Dan, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Right, but it brings back so many memories. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Thank you. So, do you mind if you just walked in? What's your name? I'm John. Um, John, what do you do? I'm the CEO of Baby Boss, which is a education technology firm. Okay, fantastic. It's good to see you. It's John. Uh, and Troy. All right, good, good. I'm good with names now. All right, good. <laughs> so, we're going to spend about 38 minutes with you guys. Talking, I'm going to talk through the details of this, and then in the end, we're going to answer a lot of questions. We're going to have a really vibrant discussion. So I appreciate you guys being here. And I don't think that this is the only way to do a start a startup pitch, but I think this is a framework. And a lot of times, when my clients come in, what they're looking for is they're looking for, hey, just tell me how to do it. What comes first, second, third, and fourth? And that helps them a lot. Now, in the end the way you actually do it may not be exactly that way but if you know if you're learning for instance to dance and you learn seven steps we well, can now recombine those in any way you want and do any number of dances from that but we learn these in order so i'm going to share with you this is a pitch uh, that that works and has worked i appreciate him mentioning um uh, jason crawford fantastic guy Went to Microsoft. Can you imagine pitching in front of Microsoft? He did a pitch out in uh, New Orleans, which is the one that Lord was talking about. And um, yeah, it was fantastic. He got a standing ovation. Uh, it's a little bit of a cheat because Jason was in the Iraq war. He was shot in the face. And he talked about that and tied that back to his product, which is uh, intent and uh, retina system. So you're looking at Camera and it can see back your eyes and tell you whether or not you're going to be getting diabetes and it's all over the place. So we are able to take this thing that happened in the Afghanistan, tie it into the pitch that he was doing right there, and he just happened to have the bullet that actually pulled out of his face. And that's, he got the, he got the uh, same operation. It's a great speech. But he got it because he left the lady out of the water. So, anyway. Let me walk you through this. Stop if you need to, but we're going to go back and talk about these pieces, piece at a time. So what we need here or anywhere else is we need a framework. Because if I give you a framework, John, it doesn't matter. We can move these things around. We can, we can go totally differently. But we got to work this stuff. Right? Most people, if they look at a blank page, they freak out. I don't know how to start. And so I want to give them a place to start. And this, uh, sure, I can see you're going to take a picture of this, and that's fine. And then we're going to be here later, so you want to take it as well. But this is a good place to start. This framework starts out with the problem. What is the problem that we're solving? Nobody buys a, a service, nobody buys a product unless they want to solve a problem. We literally are going through our lives with a bunch of problems and trying to figure out how we solve them. And when your when your piece of uh, of technology or whatever is able to help solve that problem, I get excited about it. We're looking for that. But we start with the problem. What is the problem we have? And then what is our unique solution? It's very aware that you're the first source of people. Troy and I were talking about STEM for kids earlier. Both of us, and I've met Lloyd as well, all of us are working on a very similar solution. Doesn't mean it's bad that you've got two or three people solving the same problem. But how do you really need to solve it? So it's different for you than somebody else. And so you have to talk about the solution and how it's different. And then here we talk about the impact. What's the impact that you can make? What is the chance to be brag about? So Troy, you've got a lot of books, a lot of books, a lot of videos, a lot of that's good for a huge number that of the impact. If you, if you measure that impact, how many people have read the books? How many schools have the book? How many kids you get online with your online? That's probably a really good number, isn't it? Some of them, some of them are. 
I know, but excuse me, excuse me. Let's try and make it to one of them. We're not going to go both at once. It's a pretty big number. It's also a huge estimate. Yeah, so that's our chance, right? This is our impact. And then if we're raising money, if we're asking for money, we're looking at the gap. This is okay. We have this fantastic result. George has this fantastic result. We've got 800,000 kids that have been trying to almost make it up. But what we need, why, why are you here doing the pitch? Are you asking for money? Are you asking for partnership? Are you asking for training? What's the need? What's the gap between where you are and where you'd like to be? Salesmen always sell the gap. Right? That's what we're looking for. So we spend a lot of time highlighting people think you're having great results. This is fantastic. But then, if you have all these results, what are you going to see? I mean, if you got if it's all working, hey, what are you going to see? You know, to say, what somebody else has to be. What's the difference between where you are, and this is the way everybody sells, where you are versus where you'd like to be. And that gap is where you sell. And then the ask. At a at a long training with this lady named Jody, and she's absolutely, absolutely a great leader, and she's in the healthcare space, and um, she's uh, working to get money for cancer kids, right? And we did something very similar to this, and uh, and then she had an opportunity. She had the right people in the right place. All of these people have got a lot of money, and they're all female. And all right, Jody's just going to do the pitch. Just do the pitch. It's an ask. Why are we here without this? Without the, the ask? Why are you here? You gotta ask, right? You gotta ask for the money, you gotta ask for the mentorship, ask for whatever it is, but you gotta do the ask. And uh, and she did a beautiful job. I mean, it was a really easy pitch in some respects. Because you're talking about kids, cancer, kids ringing the bell when the cancer is, is, is oh, that's what a moment when you ring that bell and you go home cancer free. It's a big deal. She did a great job and she told stories and the, the, the people in the audience had tears in their eyes. She got to step number four here. The gap. And she sat down. What are you doing? We're, you're supposed to ask for money now. And she did. She whiffed. You ever play this song? Whiff, you know, when you don't even come close to hit the ball. She did. Oh man, she did. So I get it, I get it. And she said, well, you know, Daniel, later on, you know, they know me, so they'll know where to send the check. No, no, you need the check right, right now. So that's the framework. And yeah, we'll, let, we'll make sure Lloyd gets this, uh, so he can send it out to everybody. It's the beginning. But let's talk about what's in there. What exactly do you do? This is, and a lot of times, is the biggest challenge that we have. I've, I've judged a lot of pitch competitions. And you know the number one thing, so uh, we were at UWF and there were three industry professionals, myself and two other people, and we would go out into this room and these students, incredible ideas, right? And they were so smart and they would give us the pitch and then we would go back and we would call them together and try to determine what the score was. And do you know how many times we went back and we went, I don't know what they're selling. It sounded like software, it sounded like a subscription, they may have some kind of a product. I don't know exactly. I understood that they were passionate about it. I understand what they were trying to do. I couldn't really, I couldn't tell you in a couple of words what they did. And sometimes you're like Lloyd and he's so smart that it's hard for him to get a very complex idea boiled down to something that the average person can understand. It's really hard. You know, if you look at Einstein's life, Einstein did a lot of things, but he did very little teaching because he was just so smart that unless you were an advanced physicist, you have no idea what he's talking about. And even they had a hard time keeping up with Einstein. But the smarter you are, and actually the deeper you are into your particular startup, the harder it is for you to see it like the person who's never heard of it. Right? It's really hard. That's a lot of why people call me as a speaking coach. Man, I tell you what, because I just, I, Jason, when he's talking about the Jason story, we spent weeks, Lloyd and I spent weeks 
just going one his big data system we had to go over and over and over again because he couldn't explain it to an ordinary person he was too smart not only are you too smart but sometimes you're too deep in it if you're really deep deep in it you know everything in the world about this particular subject and then i'm coming in as a potential investor or a partner or mentor or whatever and you're going to tell me about your about your startup and try to make it understandable to me in a couple of minutes, three minutes. Can you make it understandable? It's hard, I get that. What exactly do you do? And that's got to be ability to explain it to a 10 year old. Anybody know a 10 year old? Do you know somebody about that age? Okay, that's, if that means really a good partners. Why do you tell a 10 year old that you do? Now, because you're doing children's books and children's videos, you probably can explain that. Is that correct? Yes. You have trouble telling what people what you do. You just told me what you did, and I understand it pretty well. I'm not sure how you make money out of it, but that'd be another conversation. What about you, John? Uh, yes, I love to hear all this. You can, and they get it. Okay. What is it you do? Education technology. Education technology. Now, okay, that's, now I'm vague. Yeah, I know education well, and I know tech, but we created something called micro content. Micro content. Micro content. So we created micro content courses. Micro content courses basically takes an ebook yeah. and puts all of your work inside of it. Okay. Okay. You can take you through a book. Okay. All your core classes, English, mathematics, such as this, and science. So we have the patent for our technology. So we're, we're, we're in a bit of a unique space. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, microcraft. Does it make it snack size so I can absorb one tiny fact in the wrong? I love it. We all need snack snacks. I know a guy who had it at some of where when you're watching your hands, there was a, a camera there that would see you, know who you were, and then would deliver one message to you. Just a tiny message. And whatever that might be, but over the course, a cumulative. Over the course, you might get a great deal of, of uh, lessons from them, uh, just in tiny pieces at a time. I love that. All right. Yes. So can you explain to a ten-year-old, and then also can you explain it to your grandmother? The reason why grandmother is important is because grandmother isn't as technically savvy as a ten-year-old is nowadays. Okay. So can you tell it to me? I'm not asking you to, because you can't. You, you show me you can't. But can you explain what you're doing to your grandmother? Lori, can you explain the data system to your grandmother? No. <laughs> you know, big data system is such an exciting idea, but it is complex, isn't it? And I get that. So that's it. Can you explain it to your grandmother? So most of the time when we get to this point, I ask people to write their billboard. I did television for 32 years. I was uh, most of the time in the marketing department, the promotions department, and we did literally, uh, it's, it's probably not an exaggeration to say I've made 10,000 commercials in my career. Uh, and when somebody comes in and they, I don't know them, I don't know the product, and uh, we have a little sort of initial meeting, I know if, um, if they've made a, a billboard, then I've got it made. Because if they've made a billboard, you know what I know? They've already taken that very complex idea that, uh, that their business model is, and they've been able to, to cram it down into a single line, maybe 10 words or two sentences at the most. That is a lot of work, taking a complex idea and cramming it down into a couple of sentences. I'm gonna finish this sentence for me. Uh, at Geico, a 15 minute call, Anybody know what comes after that? Cost you. It saves you 15% of more of your car insurance. We literally have kids who are four years old who can say that 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 tagline. Now, why? Think about this. Do you think Geico is maybe a complex business? Maybe more complex than the one that you have? Of course it is. If it's incredibly complex, but what they have done is they've spent $250 million advertising really one line. A 15 minute call can save you 15% or more on your car insurance. That is if they 
if you've got a billboard, can you write your billboard that brief? Would you tell somebody what you do? You're standing in line at, uh, at Chuck E. Cheese. Where you're at Chuck E. Cheese, I have no idea. But if you're at, if you're at Chuck E. Cheese and you're standing in line and the guy says, What do you do? Would you say to the billboard? 15 minute call can save you 15% or more on your car insurance. That discipline of taking your complex world and making it understandable to a 10 year old, understandable to your grandmother, and then writing it down on a billboard is tremendous. It's, it, it benefits you so much. I'm a speaking coach. So my role in my entire life is being a speaking coach. And so somebody says, what do you do? I say, I'm a speaking coach. Well, most of the time they go, oh, that's kind of cool. I've never met a speaking coach before. And they say, well, how does that work? And I said, well, you know, the people that I work with are business leaders and they're really smart and they move through their careers to where they are because of their technical abilities. Now, in order to go to the next level, they have to have this other skill, which is public speaking. I help them make that leap from where they are to where they want to go. Now, that's more than a billboard, but it's a really simple explanation for who I work with and what the goal is and what they get. Let's talk about the problem that you are solving. What is the problem you're solving? Troy? Trying to connect uh, children with STEM. The themes are the same. With STEAM. Yes. STEM, of course, if anybody's listening here and you don't know, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. It is a group of uh, it is a group of learning that um, we need a lot more people in. We don't have nearly as many people in STEM as we as we need to. And uh, then STEAM is the same thing, but they have the word arts in there. And when you add arts, it all of a sudden it becomes much more vibrant because if you develop a user interface, and then you have an artistic version of it, you end up with something that's really gorgeous and works well. Does that make sense? Anyway, so connecting people, connecting, say to get children. children. With STEM. With STEM. 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 Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm messing you up because they keep saying STEM. So, connecting children with STEM. Okay. Um, what is the problem that we're solving now? We're trying to help children, we're trying to help, I would say, the world to actually connect these children with that so that they can become more familiar with science, technology, engineering, arts, and uh, mathematics. Okay. So, the problem is, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm leading you here. I'm leading the witness, by the way. Talk about the problem that you're solving. The problem is that, that children are not getting interested or staying interested or pursuing STEAM careers. That they're, they're losing that focus. Now, you're working with really young children, but they're, they're, well, the problem is we need them, you know? In, in the next generation, we need to have people who are maybe understand how pandemics work and how. Uh, vaccines work. Maybe we need somebody that's going to work, understand how the environment can be solved or solar power or whatever. We need a lot more people in that field than we have. Well, we can get them interested when they're young because of what you're doing. The problem we're solving is we don't have enough people there. We're actually importing people from other countries to do our, our STEAM work because there aren't enough here. <clears throat> and it's just because we don't pursue it as much as we should when they're young. Does that make sense? So, uh, how precisely do you solve that problem? What is the, what is the problem that you're solving, uh, John? Uh, multiple problems. Uh, one of the being uh, disengagement in what you're learning. Okay. Uh, closing the, the outcomes gap with reference to learning in the full century area, the place where I need to, the areas that, that uh, children feel like I have to speak. Mm -hmm. Whether it's science, technology, engineering, mathematics, art, or otherwise, all of them are predicated on uh, fundamental understandings of core areas, mm -hmm. which mathematics, social studies, and other things. What is the problem that you're talking about? Uh, not only that, it's the nature of the learning outcomes. The outcomes. So the people you're saying to me, like I'm a 10 year old, what is the problem you're solving? Our kids aren't learning. Our kids aren't learning. Our kids are learning. Okay. Yeah, I think it was black and brown children. Black and brown children are not learning. 
And then how precisely do you solve that problem? Can you tell me in a sentence or two? And once again, like I'm a 10 year old, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. So by providing them with a, with a familiar multiple that they can engage with, that's interactive and engage, mm -hmm. that also offers the multicultural elements that would, that would encourage them to participate in the process. For instance, having an instructor that looks like it, mm -hmm. having an aesthetic that, that, that's pleasing to them, that's, that's welcoming to them, that's, uh, that's, that's intrusive in the right ways, in particular as it pertains to uh, their emotions. How, how, how much emotions play in your life. All right, Jeffrey, um, Dan. Um, so, using that as an example, you know, it, it occurred to me if I was explaining it to a 10 year old, a 10 year old, I would say, um, um, John, you, you, you have, if you have trouble with your, your, your coursework, or you need help in math, or you need help in, in uh, science. You can use our courses to kind of get the help you need. And that, you know, in the convenience of your own home or, or, or whatever, you know, it's just like, you, so you kind of like demo it, you know, almost. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah. if a child has a problem learning, why don't we use, we can use that velocity mm -hmm. to kind of give them that remedial help and micro content. Micro content, I think, is the, the isn't that the kind of the, the real unique moment in there? It's the micro content? Yeah. We created micro content courses, which brings it real time every subject here. All right, so John, you and I are in this Chuck E. Cheese, we're getting the pizza and stuff like that. Now I want an explanation that you can give me, and I say, John, what is it you do? Give me 20 seconds and not, and not 10 sentences. Ooh, well, if you got 20 seconds, I would say micro content where there's focus on that environment or areas that you're not troubled in a key subject. Target market, kids. Uh, K-12 adults. Okay. Okay, so it's not just kids. No. See, you see how this works? And all of a sudden, I, I, might, I might not actually find your thing interesting because I'm not doing kids. Yeah. Right? But then you say, okay, well, it's, it works with adults as well. It's K-12 focus at this point, but we have our, our process. So is there a statistic or something where it probably is where people learn in snack size bits faster? Well, I start off with business research in Europe. Yeah. Uh, with something here called micro learning. Micro learning. Micro learning. From there, we created micro content and we applied it to K-12 subject matter. That's how we created it. Let's stop there for a minute because I love this. This is a great conversation, by the way. I love what you're doing. But the, what's interesting here is you ever heard somebody say your elevator speech? Well, in my world, when I talk about with your elevator speech, the idea is that you end up with a big donor. You know, you, uh, Bill Gates is in your elevator and you've got the length of a floor to convince him or, or that whoever's there to donate to your cause, to give you money, okay? And so people think what I need to do is I need to take 20,000 words and shove them all together and then create something that I can look at Bill Gates and I can blurt 20,000 words at him in, in you know, whatever the length that it takes to get to the next floor. And that's exactly the problem. What we want to do in an elevator is for you, for Bill Gates to punch the floor, go to the next floor, and you say something intriguing enough that he doesn't get out, he punches for the next floor. And then you say something else intriguing enough that he punches for the next floor. And if you do that, and then you can tell your whole story, but if you say micro learning, and then something very quick about micro learning, okay, I'm intrigued. Aren't you intrigued? Are you guys intrigued? Micro learning, and learn something in a tiny bit, and you learn it quickly, and it sticks with you, whatever it may be. But there's right there now your story, like back to Geico. Geico's got a very complex story, but we don't have time to tell the Geico story. Because I'd rather you learn one thing from me. And really learn it. It's the idea of you take a hammer and you hit a hammer 20 times on one nail and sunk in. But if you hit 20 nails one time, then you haven't really accomplished anything. So I like where you see so that's it. How, how do you precisely solve the problem? Our kids aren't learning the way we'd like for them to. But you know what we do is micro learning, which means you get a piece of content in a tiny chunk delivered to you. And you absorb it. And then guess what? 
a few minutes later, or however you deliver it, I don't know what this process is, you get another chip, chunk and another chunk. And you know what? Statistics show whatever your statistics show. Um, everybody has competition. So this may not apply to you two in the room, but the people on, on the boat, you've got this competition. Everybody's got competition. So in my case, I'm a speaking coach. You were gone, I think, when we were talking about this, John. But I'm a speaking coach. What I do is I help people become better speakers. And what happened, I've worked mainly with business leaders, and you've gotten through your career because of your technical skill. And now to get to the next level, guess what you got to do? This, you gotta make a pitch, you gotta pitch competition, you gotta do business development, you gotta go out and raise money and get investors. And all of a sudden, you take somebody that, like Roy, who's brilliant, yeah? and for him to go to the next level, he's gotta be pretty good at speaking. And, and that's what I do. So what I do is I help people like that, solve that problem, go from a technically competent person to somebody who can also speak. What do I do? Let's talk about my competition. If whenever I talk to people about this, they say, oh yeah, I do Toastmasters. Or I've done an online course. That's my two main people say that they are uh, the main competitors. And so I say, they're great. I talk about my competition and I talk about them in good terms because they really are great. That online course, fantastic. Now what it's not gonna do, Corey, is it's not gonna give you exactly what you need because it's generic for everybody that's going to watch. And when I, you and I work together, I can really precisely hone in, diagnose and treat exactly where you're good and where you're not good. And you and I can work together and solve that problem. The course is not going to do that. I love Toastmasters. Lots of my clients are Toastmasters members, but you know what that is? It's a group of amateurs that all get together and give speeches. There isn't an instructor. There isn't somebody there who's, a, you know, who's spent their life studying public speaking. All amateurs and they do it. it's fine, but you know, one of the problems is, is like playing golf. A golf pro would tell you that if you spend 10 years with a bad swing and then you come see a golf pro, they say it's really hard to unlearn. So, if you go to Toastmasters, you might learn some bad habits and never know it when you come to me and I'm trying to talk about it. So, let's talk about your competition and then how is your process different or better? What's your competition? Do you have a like? I would have like I would say like Blippi or Coco Melon and all the cartoons they have for kids and to keep them engaged. Okay. So how are you different from them? Because what we're doing is we're taking our actual characters and dressing them up in like STEM outfits, like computer techs, like astronauts, and yeah. like uh, archaeologists. Uh -huh. and we're allowing them to train and teach the children how to do it, like we talked about earlier. You put them in that particular thing. It doesn't come real to anybody unless it happens, unless they see it. That's okay. right. That's all those little cards are. But so the others are doing fine, and then most of it, like you're just they're engaging, but they're not. It's not STEM. Right. Exactly. Okay. So great. That's fantastic. Very crystal idea. Other people doing micro learning. Yeah. Technology. Technology. Uh, learning management system. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. that's the learning management system. But nobody's doing it in micro learning that you're aware of. That's fantastic. So your competition is more um, everyday learning. It's well, not everyday learning. It's technical specific. Four subject areas. Four subject areas. So you're really competing with the schools. No, uh, we are helping to, to classroom learning. Okay. We're not okay. replacing the classroom. We are assisting the teachers to learn. Yeah. In, in many cases, the person has a very direct competition. And it's not, nobody's going to believe you if you say, you know, we're the electric car of the future. Well, everybody's going to say, well, wait a minute, that's just kind of taken off. Well, you know, one of the things that we foresaw is that ultimately there's going to be a time when virtual learning and learning from spaces uh, all over the world, just like people are learning now, it's going to be much more complex. Yeah. We, we took the, the term micro content because soon micro content would be how so made. So we trademark. I know. Okay. Not only do we trademark it, but we trademark the, the other elements associated with our platform and then we patent it what we do with the platform. Yeah. So that's what makes us a lot different than everyone else. And that's why I can say we say, well, nobody does it like we do. Right. But we're a lot different. So that's why I said, you know, we we come from it from an angular position 
that is unique because, first of all, they're not very many African Americans in the space that's not good mm -hmm. that do education technology, particularly the way we do it. And the other piece is nobody has our perspective because African Americans are in the space. Mm -hmm. So, all, all of our platforms are universal, we have ever seen it. It means that they were specifically created for the specific learning gaps and performance gaps, understanding gaps, competency gaps. So whereas most classrooms are looking for a year to year learning, our effort is for a year and a half to two years of learning per year per usage of the other online classes. We're able to be used in a lot of sort of fashion or specifically guided by teachers, instructors, and administrators or otherwise. Our platform is, is, is quite a new thing, but we're quite a number of different spaces. So that's fantastic. I'm really excited about both of you guys and what you do. All right. So then let's talk about your impact, right? You've had impact. How long have you been doing this? It's been about 11 months now. 11 months? You've got this much content in 11 months? Yes. Yeah. So, hey, right then, which <laughs> the rest of us need to get How long does it take you to write a book? Uh, reading would be two hours and about three weeks. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I just finished my STEM book, it took me three hours. Three hours? Mm -hmm. down here. Okay. So, <laughs> You have impact though. In eleven months, you have an impact. You have how, well. That's right. We just talked about this. How many people? How many books? How many hits? How many? You know, we need to be able to measure our impact. So here's what we want to be able to say. The reason why I think you should partner with me, or you should mentor me, or I should get this particular grant, is because of our impact. Right? It's really hard for granting organizations and mentors and if you're trying to get space to work in it's really hard for them to say yes if you just have an idea and you don't have uh if you don't have actual numbers mm -hmm. so you have numbers at this point oh yes okay yeah. numbers look good yes. really so it's really working it's working in, in in theory but now you're actually doing it you're actually getting results well we did is we made a test in our software yeah we made a test your software Check the numbers. We know the other elements. All right, now we have quite a number of features inside of our natural That's another thing that makes our product much different than any other learning management system. Most learning management systems, if not all of them, are just websites. We're not much. We're not just a website. Uh, the mobility piece, uh, flexibility of our software, the interactive nature of our software makes us much different. And all those things are much different than every other learning from Google's learning management. Microsoft's education platforms. So, so, John, I can guarantee you love what you're doing, but your your big challenge is going to be taking ten pounds of stuff and shoving it in a three and a half minute speech. Well, what we did is that because we weren't sourcing money in that way, what we did is we went directly to school missions. So our conversations were a lot different than a simple pitch. Okay. So getting in, in, you know, we have other businesses, so the the proposition of raising money was. A too, so Once again, I'm in, I'm in Chi Chi's, you know, I'm getting uh, something in front of you. I need a 30 minute, 30 second, this is what we do. Compelling, maybe a statistic. Yeah, we, we were in GBA. Were you were in the GBA program? How's that going? We were well. We were actually in the GBA program. Okay, good. So we, uh, we had a great program right now. And of course, we got to be in front of investors. And did you do you have checks? Do you get do you get money? No, we didn't get any money. Um, what we got was a proposition. Well, we were so we were so fair with it. We had to start our beta testing. Yeah. Beta testing didn't start in August. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know they want to see those things work. So what we told people was that we no longer need your dollars, we'll just fund ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, because you have to be that bold for you. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Okay, so here's this, the piece where we talk about our impact. How many people, how many books, how many, whatever, this is the impact statement. This is a chance for you to brag on yourself, you know? And a lot of times it's a chance for you to tell a story about how you change somebody's life, you know? Talk about your impact, you say, share a statistic. When you give a, a presentation, if you have one statistic, the, the science tells us you have a 62% more believability rating, even if that statistic is totally made up. 62%. And I made up that number. <laughs> and then it's a great place to share a story. 
if we have an impact and we have, we have an opportunity to talk about, you have an opportunity to talk about somebody who's read the book, watched one of the videos, and it's something that made their life better. Certainly, if you're talking about micro learning, some people are just going to love that and eat it up, and they're going to get they're going to get much smarter very fast. How much, how many, how often? Those kind of questions. See, that's the first thing. If, if, if we were on in, in the elevator together and I had a lot of money and you said you leaned over to me and you said this is what I would do, I want to know how much, how many, and how often. I want to know those. I'm really frustrated with a particular nonprofit in town. I'm trying not to share, share any details so you know what it is. But the problem is they talk, it's a huge problem. This is what they tell me. It's a huge problem. It happens a bunch of times. And I'll say, well, how many? Is it one person? Is it one person a month? Is it, no, it's more than that. Well, how many? Is it? How many times? How many? Often, how often? And how big of a deal is it? And before, I'm not cutting checks, but if, before I cut a check, I would cut it. I would want to know the scope. I want to know the scope of this. You know. So how? Talking about the impact. How many? How often? So when I was talking about Jody and the kids with cancer, yeah, she had a very very specific number. That this is how many kids we treat with, for cancer every every month, and she had very good numbers on those because, of course, it's a hospital with people with good scores. On that. So that's an impact thing, and then that's where you sell. As you talk about the gap, here's what I am, here's what I've got, here's what I've done. We need to get to the next level. In order to get to the next level, you know what we're going to need? We're going to need funding. We're going to need resources. We're going to need mentorship. We're going to need whatever. But we sell during the gap. And then the ask. And you cannot avoid the ask. I know that's the part that scares everybody. And then we wait and we listen. Um, I watched this a video, and it was a real video, a real thing that happened, but they had put in at a car lot, they had put in some cameras and the video said this woman who came in looking for a car, and it was a man, oh, this is a long time ago, I think it was in the 1990s, a man uh, selling a car. And it was a training video, so people would see what it actually looks like when you sell a car. And the man talked about the car, and he said it's got an overhead cam, it's got a dual lock again, differential, it's got uh, fuel injection, all-wheel drive, and um, power steering or whatever, and he'd like hit all those things. And she looked at him and she's like, Okay, I've got two dogs. One of the dogs is elderly, and, and he's a big dog. He's like part German Shepherd, or, uh, yeah, um, St. Bernard. And I can't really lift him. And I've got two kids, and the kids, one's in band, and the other's in, in soccer. And I'm picking them up and taking them to practice all the time. And I'm picking, and the kids always, the dogs always want to go, and I have to load the dogs into the car. And I've got an SUV, and then, you know, it's a big SUV. And as you know, the lift gate on the SUV is way up here. You get to the point where this big dog I can't even lift anymore. I get him in the car, and then every time you pick up somebody at soccer, it's not just the one kid. Now you got to pick up four or five kids and take them all back to their houses, and they have so much equipment. And you know, and then I get into the parking lot at Target. I don't know if you go to Target, but if you go to the car Target, the parking spaces are fairly small, and so I have to back in and move in, back up and move in. The SUV is so big that it's really tough for me to get in and out. And then the man looks at her and says, "Well." You want fuel injection or not? And you see, now what happened in that is instructive to our pitch because what happens after you do your pitch and whatever it is you say, that's not the pitch. Now the pitch is what happens next. The, the, you hopefully have intrigued people enough that they want to ask you questions. If you watch Shark Tank, of course, this is the most entertaining thing. They get up and they do a three minute pitch or five minute, whatever it is. And then the sharks, if they're interested, ask them million questions and they have their own takes on things. And then they're, and, and what's happening is they're selling themselves during that. Or more importantly, they're telling you how they want to be sold. So in that case with the woman, she's saying, I don't care about the engine. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you anything about an engine, but I need room for all my kids' stuff. I need a low lift height because I can't get my dog up in there anymore. And I'd like to have a car that fit in a regular parking space without a headache. 
And so if he's what what if he were listening, he would have heard her say that. He would have turned his corner to a different pitch and would have said, Oh, okay, sounds like to me you're talking about a minivan. Because minivans are very close to the ground, so it's not a big lift. Uh, they park in any parking space, they're the same size as a regular car, and they got tons, I mean literally tons and tons of room. Is that what you're talking about? She said, I don't know. You know, maybe go for one. But the, the sharks in this case, uh, will tell you what they're, what of all the things that you said. So I continue to be really excited about you with micro learning. So I, if I were an investor, you could dodge a lot of those other things and just talk to me about the benefits and techniques of micro learning. And I might cut your check because that's all I've asked you about, right? I've asked you about everything because I love this, all the things that you do. Uh, but Anyway, listen to them because they will tell you how they want to buy. I'm working with a guy in Silicon Valley, but he's actually in, 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 um, he's in Colorado. He's in Colorado, high tech company, cybersecurity, real high level stuff. Oh my God. You talk about trying to make his stuff simple enough that everybody can hear it and understand it. That's a challenge because it's cyber. It's not just cybersecurity. I mean, it's like at some different level of cybersecurity. They can scan documents that have been saved as PDFs and archived over there, and they can tell you whether or not there's a threat. I mean, they just go really deep on it. But um, what, what, what was I going to tell you this story for? I'm always telling the story. That's the other thing, is I want you to be able to tell stories. Well, we did that, right? We, we pushed you really hard to be able to tell stories. So, um, what is important is that we let them talk and then listen to what they say. And Troy, with you, they may they may say, well, that's great. How many videos do you have? And so now you're a lot of books, but maybe the thing they're really intrigued about is your videos. Or maybe this mascot, do you have a mascot that somebody walks around with you? Yeah. So it could be their mascot. I think that's really fascinating. Mascots are huge, I guess you know. But I mean, you, if you go to an event, you could have 30 people, 30 companies show up uh, with booths and giveaways and everything. One of them has a mascot. Guess what all the kids do? Run for that mascot. As a matter of fact, when you're talking about Steve and my STEM, I should probably get a mascot. If people would flock to it, you know? Uh, so let's talk about how this all works when you put it together. You don't get 20 minutes usually to speak. You have five or three. And increasingly, it's even less than that. So, how do you say quickly what it is you do? And that's what we're going to practice now. So, uh, and I can tell you what I do. I'm Daniel Pennington, a speaking coach. I work with a lot of uh, leaders who need to get to the next level. And in order to get to the next level, they have to have this other skill, which is speaking skills. That's what, I don't know, it's 20 seconds or something. But you get it, right? You know what my target looks like, you know the problem that I'm solving in order to get to the next level, and uh, you know what I do. Is any of that complicated? Do we lose anybody in that? And we only have two, three people in the room besides me. But let's do the same thing, because I'd like for John to be able to say in 20 or 30 seconds or a minute, what it is you do. So it's a challenge. I know you didn't come here today to do that because you say you're getting your money the other way. But if you were sitting next to Bill Gates in the elevator, I would love for you to give a pitch that was interesting enough that Bill Gates pushes the button and goes to the next level with you. And I would love for you to come back with a big check because unlike Lloyd, who would actually share it with me, he's made all that money out of here and has shared it with me at all. And I. Yeah, and actually, when you talk about uh, Jason, Mike, what is that guy for me? Nine million dollars. Do you know what I got? I feel so what's, Ben, what's your revenue model? <laughs> <laughs> Not very good. <laughs> <laughs> actually, blush, blushing. No, but no, okay, so, so you have 20 seconds. You have you have a minute, you're going from one floor to another, and there is somebody that could help you in some way. Maybe it's not cash, but maybe they're, you know, in charge of a big school system, or maybe it's um, 
somebody that uh, works for the Khan Academy. And, and you know what that is, right? Uh, anyway, so you got a minute. Tell me in a minute what you do. I was standing before the next time said, hey, let's change the world. Hmm. Let's change the way children learn by improving the way children learn. And we'll do it with micro learning. Let's, let's put micro content in front of every child and every adult learner in every situation. And we can do it tomorrow. Love it. That got me now I'm intrigued. Right? Are you guys intrigued? Yeah. Is that good? All right, so now it comes to the button and I say, now I want to know how you get that content in front of all of these people. So that's, I'm Bill Gates. But let's partner with schools. Let's partner with states. Let's partner with counties. Let's partner with municipalities to improve the, the work effects. And we'll improve the work effects by improving the work effects. How do I get the content in front of people? We have every, through every device, whether it's mobile, desktop, tablet, let's put the learning where the learning is needed in real time. Okay, I still don't know exactly. Am I going to my website? Is it coming to me? It's coming, it's coming through my computer, right? I'm going to follow the path of the learning. So, do I have to go find it? Are we, are we running out of time? No, you're good. Okay. Huh? It's going to come to me. Okay, so, all right. Imagine. You successfully convinced Bill Gates, and he's giving you enough money to do really what you want. Now, how how does my daughter encounter this content? Does she go look for it? Comes to the school district. Comes to the right. school district. So, am I sitting in class and um, receiving my content? Yeah. And, and it's just recorded. Classroom, out of classroom, you can receive it at any period of time. See, I try, I'm so confused. You know what? Are you confused? I don't know how it actually happens. You know what I'm saying? So the the friend of mine that does this, when you stand in front of the sink and you wash your hands, it recognizes that there's a person there, and it recognizes that it's you, and then delivers a tiny message for you. Now that's what I'm looking for. That that how does that structure? So I my daughter or granddaughter. How do they receive this? You say it comes through their phone, or they no, going they're, somewhere? They're logging into the system. They're logging in. So this is this is into the system. Okay. And once they're onboarded into the system, then we can push knowledge to them. Okay, so I sign up, or somebody signs up. I do, yes. And maybe I'm. And would it make sense that it's um, maybe learning a language? Yes. Okay. So I want to learn uh, French because I'm going to Paris in a year. And um, I sign up and I say, okay, that's what I want to learn. And then, does it interrupt my, do I, when I'm making a phone call or does it, does it show up just on its own? And my phone lights up and it says, je veux dire. Let me help out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think um, what, what John's um, doing is like, you're, you're trying to give it the demo as part. Yeah, and, and so, uh, uh, Little Johnny, he's having trouble in his fifth grade class. He's falling behind in math. Right. And he's falling behind in science. So his, his teacher, since the school district already has our micro content, the teacher refers Johnny to, the, to our software so he can, on his own time at home or wherever, after school, he can actually get caught up in the material. Okay. So it's I subscribe to it or I well, sign up for it. Yeah, so so so, so John, you know, bear with me a little bit here. So so part of the secret to what so so I, I kind of disagree with, with the way John said what his problem is because like kids, there's hundreds of thousands of kids that get in these remedial programs throughout the United States and throughout the country. And so uh, a bunch of money is being spent on these kids. Right. But they, they, they're still struggling. We have a different approach. We, we have content of remedial stuff that is culturally based that they can actually come in with. Part of this, the, uh, the problem with our school system today is they teach in this Euro, European centric way. We come at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. we, we actually uh, put cultural people of color in front of these students that are, that are struggling. In our micro content courses. And so, if, if 
each school, they get money to, to, per kid to help them with the medical training. Mm -hmm. We 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 use that's how we that's how we, where the revenue comes from from our product. So all we have to do is is on board the school system. And then as as their students are having trouble with their lesson, they get on board to our product. And and we we make such and such for each student that gets on our product. I'm still I'm confused. Okay. So little Johnny goes in the remedial. You got micro content. Is he sitting in front of a TV watching micro content? How does he how does he actually get it to him? You know, you said it's on his phone, but little Johnny's too young to No, no. He can he can access the micro content through the basic means by which he access any other platform, to the computer, to the desktop, to the mobile device. Okay, so he said we put him in the we put him in the classroom, and then he sits over here, and he clicks on the on the on the monitor, and it shows him micro content. Yes. Okay. How long is micro content? What micro is? It could be anywhere from twenty to thirty minutes. Twenty to thirty minutes. Okay. And so he's absorbing those. Now, the statistic is there. Is there? Yes, plenty of statistical data. It, uh, it, that's, it, that says focus learning, which is which is healthy, is eighty percent of micro. Short burst learning. Okay. So, and then he, if he goes home, if he's on the bus, if he's other places, he can also access that same stuff. Right? But statistics show that it's more effective than like an hour long lecture series. Right? Okay. I, I like that. I like that. So, um, okay. That makes sense. I think, we're, you know. Well, see, I think it's, you know, for us, you know, when we start talking about technology, mixed with education, and we're talking to educators, it's a, it's a, it's a different conversation. Yeah. We're talking to novices or people who are not connected to education, or technology, what's happening in the classroom, what we're talking it's a different thing. But when we talk to them, they are saying we. Got you. What they're saying is that, listen, we, we can deal with these technologies and our kids are suffering. Mm -hmm. What is it that you It's different. And once they see it, and see, once you see my content, it's a whole nother song. It's a whole nother song. So, it, uh, for, for educators, we've had no issue at all. Yeah. Uh, so, those who are outside the education realm, we don't think about it, but we do get an answer. You know, we, we represent, uh, you know, it could be a little challenge if you're just here and talking about it. Well, let, me, let me tell you a story that I got into. So, this is just to, as, as, a, as a cautionary tale, I guess. Mm -hmm. I am um, a bunch of architects here in town um, were really residential architects, but they had a chance at building a big building on a college campus. And they had to go and make a pitch. And they brought me in really kind of last minute and they said, Daniel, we want to do the pitch and you tell us what you think right and wrong. And they went through and did the pitch, but they used words that I didn't understand. And that's sort of my job is to say, what is, what is fenestration? And then a few minutes later, what is, what is, what is, and I asked the, all these questions and they got done. They said, what do you think? And I said, I, I think you got a lot of, you're going to really, there's going to be somebody in that room that's just going to be lost. And you know, the st saying goes that the confused consumer does not buy. And I think that is true. If they're confused, nobody ever buys. And, and these people say, no, David, listen, listen, everybody in that room that we're going to pitch in front of, they're all business industry professional they they build construction for a living and i all the way through for the last day they were still saying these words and still losing me and i complained the whole time they got in there and they did the pitch and they did not get the business and then they heard through a friend of a friend that what happened so here's what's happened is this was a medical like a, a addition to the college where they would put a medical school and it was bought by the you ever heard of the golden rule person with the gold makes the rules. And so there was a, a, a medical person who had made devices and he had made millions and millions of dollars. He had attended that school and so he wanted to give back and he gave the money for this building that was gonna have his name on it. Well, he just happened to be in town when these guys were doing the pitches. And so medical device company manufacturer sat in the room and they said fenestration and they said flying buttresses and everything else. And somebody said that at launch, 
he was in there making coffee and just getting his coffee and he was just mad as a hornet. And he said, I don't understand the damn thing these people say to me. He said, I'm just so frustrated here. I don't even want to be here. You need to be able to pitch inside the inside school and people who know don't know anything about it. Because the people who are going to give you money aren't necessarily all going to be school people. And even if they are, who pays for the school? You know, if you can't make that, uh, if you can't make that politician get it, they're not going to, they're not going to say, this is great. Let's do more of this. Let's spend more money on, on micro learning. You have to talk to them too. They're going to be part of your plan, you know? And even if they don't, the, even the other thing that happens when you, when you condense your complicated story into something small is a lot of times the person who hears your pitch is not the person who writes that check. But if you gave me something in a, in a couple of minutes that I could get, then next week when I'm connected with, I don't know, I've got a good, two good friends who are politicians, and I could be saying to them, well, have you tried this micro-learning? This is really exciting stuff. A friend of mine does, does and I would be able to deliver your message to them as long as I understood it and I'm not an educator. So a lot of what we try to do is, is when, when you're, working on your piece, chances are the person you're talking to, I might come out of here and think you're you've got the greatest in the history of the world. <laughs> if I understand it enough, then I know like, I know everybody in principal. So I I might be sitting with somebody else. So Dan, what I tell people is it's like so uh, it takes money to build this application that John was trying to build. And so you, you're, you're pitching to, to raise the funding to build it. You're pitching to raise the funding. To, once you get that uh, market fit, you, then you need to scale it out larger. Then you're pitching, you know, to get the funding to, to do that. Even, even so, even though your, your business may be making a, a lot of money, there still may be a cash flow issue. And so you, you may need to pitch this the, to get the cash flow to, to you know, to, to, um, to, yeah. to, to yeah. get through a low, low cash flow. That's exactly it, in cash flow. It, and, you know, there, if it's a big, if it's a big thing that everybody's excited, do we have comments or thoughts from anybody online? Yeah, uh, Carlos is um, asking about, he, his um, uh, company, Polisol, uh, is, is, a, is about helping um, people that are being bullied, children or young people that are being bullied. But he wants to kind of come up with a uh, use art to kind of help him get through that. So he's an artist, and so he's he's looking for ideas on you know how to um, pitch that. How to pitch that? Well, it's uh, using art to combat bullying. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got a friend that uses puppets and and mascots and stuff to try. <laughs> so maybe that's that's one of them. But how do you do the pitch? Well, what are you doing currently, Carlos? That, that's the question. And what if, if, if I was standing in line at, at Publix with you, and I said, what do you do? How can you say that in terms that a 10-year-old or your grandmother would, um, would be able to understand? That's what we have to do. You, this guy, if you, have, you know what Big Data Systems does? Oh my gosh, that was complicated getting that camera down into a couple of things. So what is it? What is the problem you're solving? Bullying, I get it. And then how specifically are we solving the bullying problem through art? Yes, yeah, so uh, for, for Carlos, um, he, you know, he's had a couple of suggestions and one was creating a course, um, you know, to, to kind of walk people through that. I assume he was art working in the course. But another thing you can recommend to do is create a platform that, um, um, you know, match um, people that are building with therapists and also give them opportunity to buy his art as well. Those are the two approaches that I'm aware of. That okay. Well, let's stop right there. And I told you about um, the, the you know, you have pitch competition. And, and right, I told you about this. I didn't. Okay, so I, a bunch of us building, uh, a bunch of us were up at UWF, they brought us in, listened to pitches, 
and then to decide which pitch should win the competition. And, um, you know, we really cared. We were personally invested in these kids. And that was, they were exciting. They did really exciting stuff. Uh, but we would go out and the three of us would stand and we would hear somebody's pitch and then we would go back and put us around our table and have a ear shot of other people. And the number one thing that we said when we got back to the table was, I don't know what they do. You know, they have something that sounds almost like they're doing a subscription, but it's also uh, some kind of a software and, uh, and, they, and they're trying to get Jim's involved in this, and I'm going to tell you what they do. And that, there wasn't a single person that we voted yes for that we were confused about. It is so complicated. We all, and I will include myself in this, we get so deeply involved in our own stuff. We know it so much that I could, you know, literally, I, I was telling uh, Carlos about, I mean, sorry, uh, Troy, okay, Troy, about this, that um, I work for, I do have a STEM thing that I'm doing myself, and I could spend six days talking to you about it, but if I had to do a pitch competition, could I do it? Yeah. But it's hard, it's hard to take all that knowledge that you have and condense that. But anyway, nobody at, at this pitch competition that, we, that confused us got our vote. Now the rest of them, got a vote and we voted either really good or really bad. But if you confuse us, we didn't have any ability to decide if it's a good idea or not because we really didn't know what the idea was. And it sounds a little bit like that's where Carlos is. Yeah. It could be bullying, it could be art, and it could be uh, mentoring, and that's fine. I want everybody to know that we all go through that process yeah. where we have a couple of ideas and we're playing with this and we're playing with that. And all of that, that's maybe outside the scope of where we are today. This is more like you have something, and now you're trying to pitch it. So, so, so the, you know, so, um, in the startup um, world, you, you should actually learn how to pitch your idea before you actually start building it. <laughs> and, and so that, that's what people need to understand. And you can pitch it clearly, and people can help you do what you're trying to sign to build. So I have another question here. Should the pitch focus more on the solution or the value, or is it one and the same? Well, the solution obviously brings the value, right? I mean, yes. That's, so the solution, the value, I mean, if we go, and it's good to see you. Thank you for your help. Um, but the value, you know, no, nobody wants for instance, a three-quarter inch grip. Who goes out and says, my gosh, I'd like to have a three-quarter inch yeah. grip. We're looking for holes to hang something, and we're really, if you look at it, we're actually doing this because our wife wants a shelf. So really, my motivation for this is my, making my wife happy. So Daniel wants to make his wife happy, and so he's buying the drill so he can do what she wants to do, right? So that's my motivation. Yeah, but I, I know it's on the framework that the beginning slide when you show the framework, um, you know, one of the early things was, you know, describing the problem that's going right. on. And I, and I think people, that's kind of like, people have to understand the problem before they can understand their solution. Really good point. Yeah. Really good point. Is maybe, that, and go back to Carlos, and, and I appreciate the comment and the question there, but there's a, there's a period of time when we are brainstorming. Yes. And it's very valuable that we have smart people like you guys run that we can bump ideas off of. And that's a really great time. But it's also, it's finite. And at some point you say, okay, now we have something that we're actually going to build something out like when he's done. And, and then you get into that process. But during that, during that brainstorming, what we want to do is we don't want to spend a, a ton of money. Right. We want to do a really quick, you know, mock-up. Yes. Yeah. And so that's that's what the whole idea of any startup methodology is. Most people think they need to go out and build something, you know, and all that. But you, you are actually uh, trying to solve a problem. But what your idea of the problem may not be the problem. So that's why we have to do the customer discovery. 
Well, and see what the real problem is. So you, you, you build when you when you work on your idea and start building it, then you know what the real problem is. But if you think you are, if you think uh, if you don't have to talk to the customers, uh, potential customers, to validate that that that's the problem they want you to solve, then then, then you're, you're you're spending money and you're not sure what whether you're building something that somebody wants. And so like. But like John was saying, you know, he, he's, he's got all these features, but in the starting methodology, you, you work on the minimum features first and get some traction with that, and then you add other features later. And this may go for Troy as well. He's yeah. got a lot of products. Yeah, he's got, he's got a lot. So you want to find that most, the customer that's, 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 got, that's got the biggest pain for that problem. Right. And then you, they're, they're your early adopters because they're looking for our kind of solution. And that's what's so powerful about John's and Wall Street product. They, they got so many kids that are falling behind, and they got kids of color that are falling behind. Mm -hmm. and, and so they haven't come up with a solution. The, 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 the superintendents, the teachers are scratching their head. Right. And so when they, when they see what John is doing and Jessica is doing, they say, wow, this is totally different. I think we can use it. I think we can use something like this because they know what's going on that's not working. Right. And so and what's also good about what they're doing is that they have relationships with these, these teachers and these um, superintendents. So they, they actually you know uh, get the feedback on what, what the problem is. But but so John is at the stage right now where he still talks about how fantastic. The, um, the product is, and you should be talking about demoing the product, you know, who uses it and how they use it, how they use it. And that's what I kind of that's, Yeah, that's really a good insight there yeah. is that we all fall in love with our own stuff, yeah. but the consumer doesn't care about your stuff. They yeah. have a problem and they need a solution. Yeah, and, and um, uh, Cameron, that's what he was asking to do. The uh, pitch, you know, the uh, the, the solution or, or, or the value, you know, the customer gets a value from you solving your 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 solution, solving their problem, uh, solving their problem. Right. You know, that, that's where the the value comes in, and so you have to have this great relationship with the customers, and that's the advantage, you know, John and Jessica have to have a great relationship. But when it comes to you know raising the funding to build what you have to pitch competitions and talking to investors, that's what we're here today was for is to kind of show you how to articulate your uh, idea clearly so so you can actually get the check. Right. Or get embedded into the program. Yeah, and I think that is really it, is 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 making that idea clear and then making it clear what the problem is and then clear what your solution is. Yeah. And then clear how you uh, compare with <clears throat> if you've got competitors. Yes. And really, it's taking a lot of information and condensing it to a very few bullet points. Yeah, and that's what I like about participating in pitch competitions because, you know, like I said before, you know, I, I went um, and, you know, learned how to pitch my idea and well, I thought I was going to pitch it in seven minutes. And then the next pitch competition, I got to cut it down to four minutes, and I was like, "How the hell am I going to do that?" Yeah. And, and and then the next competition, I got only got two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. I said, "Well, how the hell am I going to do that?" Mm -hmm. And so what what I learned from that process is that you have to learn how to say what you're going to say as clear and with as few words as possible. Right. And that's and, and that's and that's really why you want to hear stuff. So you can actually learn how to do that, right? Yeah, and that's and that's valuable even if you're not raising money, right? Because I know business owners who've been in business for 25 years, and they finally end up in my, in, you know, working with me, and I say, well, how do you talk about your business? I don't know. And they're terrible at it 25 years later. Well, if you could go back to first year and learn how to talk about it really, really well, mm -hmm. then you got 25 years of being more effective. And, and you know, a lot of business owners, if you ask them, what do you do? They ramble and they're all over the place and it's really hard to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not raising the plan, still mm -hmm. you've got the customers, 
Yeah, so like, so startup world, this is, this is so, I'm glad we were um, talking about this. Um, so like, um, so let's say you're in a situation you already got customers, and let's say you're getting a bunch of customers, and you're growing, but you don't have the money to grow. Yeah. So now you need to pitch to, to, to investors to get the funding to scale. So you, you found a secret formula to getting customers, but you your current operating thing that you're doing, it can't handle with so many people. Right. But you, you got more people coming in, so you're overloading your, your system. And so now you got to scale your system up. So, and then, um, so like for example, next Friday is it is a, a Black Friday, right? Right. So let's say you, there's a lot of demand for your product on, on, on Black Friday. And right now your 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 product, you can your your software, your cloud thing can only handle, you know, maximum, you know, three hundred folks at the same time. But let's say now you you're getting people like what you got, and now you gotta get it where you can handle a million people at the same right. time. And that that's when you've got to pitch to get the the, the seed funding to, to kind of scale your brand. An example of that is is uh is Zillow. So Zillow prior to the pandemic, uh, I think it was nine million calls on Zillow in a year. Mm -hmm. The, the, the 2021, 2020 rather, when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. 300 million calls. Wow. And you can imagine the infrastructure that was required, the, 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 the hiring that was required, all of that stuff that was required. So now I'm okay, well, I'm, I'm like John says, I'm good at this, I'm good at this, I'm good at this. But now this isn't where you go. Now you got to go to a bank. What is a bank or an investor? What do they want? Mm -hmm. Tell it to me quick. Help me to understand, of course, we all understand Zillow now, but we didn't back then. Mm -hmm. And then how am I going to get my money back and then some? And simple, simple. And I got no time to do it. Yeah, I right. so like the other, other thing I want to mention. So like a, a, a lot of the folks we're working with, they're still in the idea stage and they're trying to learn how to pitch their idea. So, so but in order to get help, get mentors, get, get um, uh, access to different programs, you have to, you know, be able to pitch your idea and then in order to um, pick up. So we, we host a pitch competition and we, we got one that's the deadline is the 29th of this month. So we've got less than a couple of weeks you need to get your application in. And but you know, so it's coming up pretty quick, but but the deal is so would they use your framework um, to write your idea? So our thing is it's pretty simple. You you describe your idea in, in um, um, 200 words. So to me, you would use the, the same template to, to make sure that you clearly, you know, write down your, your thing. So believe it or not, when you're pitching, you, you have the script that's going from that end to the Right. So in, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and how do you solve it? How are you unique in the way you solve it? How you've already had an impact. Yes. Hopefully, you've had some kind of impact. And then the gap. Now, We've had this impact. We want to have a large impact, but we have to have some money to help us get to the next one. Yes, exactly. Right. And then our ask for you is if you'll help us out with this and whatever it is, you yeah. have to ask. Yeah. And then no, so love, love the opportunity to pitch and, and um, you know, when, you know, when some um, funding and I will use it, you know, to, to do this for, for my product. Of course, on the Shark Tank, they have very specific needs, but that's a different stage, a different stage of, uh, of a startup. Um, so you're you're um, you're you're um, so they have on and all different kinds, but you got to realize that that's for uh, uh, entertainment. And um, but and it's also it, it's they call it short tank because this you being squeezed. Yeah. So um, and, and they're taking a chunk of your but the, the benefit is that you get into TV exposure and, and you get a partner that that actually can help you go to the next. Its level. So when you when you're earlier than than they are on Shark Tank, and so so the point is when you start with the system, you know there are organizations that help you when you just have an idea, uh, and, and there's organizations once you validate your idea, then there's organizations or the same organizations that help you turn that into a concept, and then as you build your MVP. There's organizations and legal systems that help them do that. Mm -hmm. And then, and then when, you, when you get that product market fit, then, then there's uh, uh, folks in the ecosystem that helps you, 
you know, get the money to go out. And I, I tell people this story a lot was, uh, I had to learn all this stuff the hard way, but, I, but the way I learned was by participating. Right. So I was down in Miami and at, at a, uh, I think it was uh, uh, something in America or something. But anyway, it, it was a startup showcase type of event. And so all the people from the Miami you know, ecosystem were at this event. And so you got you met different people in the ecosystem doing stuff. And you, um, then there's all the startups they had booths that you got to go by and talk to them. But on my last day there, I was talking to this, I got introduced to this lady, and she worked for a nonprofit. Her nonprofit, you remember I told you what, how you need money to kind of scale? Yeah. So startups and companies, they get stuck at this five to ten million dollar revenue zone. And, and they have certain practices that they do that don't allow them to make more money. Right. And so she said, well, our nonprofit, we we work with those type of companies and help them break through that ceiling of $10 million and scale up to a lot of money. So the company's already made the $10 million. Right. So you got a nonprofit helping them get bigger. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So the ecosystem is literally that yeah. power. Yeah. yeah. But through all of this, from the beginning, mm -hmm. when you sit down with your spouse or with your friends and you say, here's my idea, mm -hmm. you have to be able to talk about it in a way that makes sense. You have to be able to say, here's the problem, here's how we solve it. Here's the impact we've already had. Here's the gap between where we are and where we need to be, and we want you to help. Yeah, and so, and so and we got a lot of founders out there working by themselves. And, and so it's hard to be created by yourself. So as we, you and I talk, you get ideas. And that's what, you know, yeah. having co founder working on the right. same idea. And that's why, you know, we do the network industry so you can actually talk to other people. And, 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 let, and let them know what you're trying to do. And you get help with your idea. So you, you get connected with all these things, and before, before you know it, you're getting the help you need to kind of, kind of move forward. Right, right. And so one of the things there is you have to have quality feedback. And what yes. I mean by that is, you know, everybody's got a grandmother, and you go to your grandmother and you say, honey, I'm going to build a, a business that's about making chicken sweaters. Mm -hmm. Do the worst idea in the world, but your grandmother would be like, oh, that's great, love that. You need somebody who's going to challenge you to say, why aren't there chicken sweaters right now? You know, what are, how's that marketing going to go? You need to have people who are going to be honest with you. Yes. Yeah, Rock, Roger just showed up. He's one of our mentors, and he, he's like the Mr. Shark Tank guy. So he, yeah. <laughs> Ronnie and I are uh, old friends, but he and I worked together at Studer Group, and yes. now he's on my board at, at Stan Short. So, Fantastic. Uh, really a great guy. and. and so, yeah, but yeah, even from the beginning, hone that message into something that's easy to understand. You know, obviously you're gonna to wanna to run it by a lot of people. Yes. And as you go through all of those steps in your process, get better and better and better able to talk about, about your product. How are we doing on time? So, I think, I'm gonna check and see if we got any more questions online that we can sort of kind of wrap things up. Um, okay, let's see what we got. Yeah, uh, Cameron says thank you, and Carlos says um, thanks for answering uh, the, the questions. I, yeah, so I think we're good, you know. Okay, well, just as we leave, I, I just want to wrap it up by saying what you're doing is incredibly hard. It is incredibly hard to take an idea that you have and to make it into a business that actually works. There are so many ways that you can die along the way. Yes. It is so much easier for you to fail than it is for you to succeed. And you want to fail without spending a lot of money. You don't want to spend a lot of money. You want to get into it for a little bit of money and you want to fail and you fail forward. And actually all of the companies that we see that are successful have failed forward and they've learned and developed and, and gotten better. But I just want to say that it's without people like you guys that this country would never work. Yes. People that are willing to put themselves out there and take risks and look stupid and borrow money from their relatives and start up a company, that is the ultimate American thing to do. And it's beautiful when it works. And I know I'm a small business, my, I'm, mine is a small business as well, and I spend about a third of my time scared to death that it's not gonna work. And I'm waiting the next check, or I'm waiting the next uh, the next thing to come in. So, but what you're doing is is remarkable. And and uh, Lloyd is absolutely right. 
What you need to do, what we all need to do, is we need to be good at reaching out to people. Because there's a lot of help out there all the way along. Find people that you trust and you like and connect with them because there's somebody else out there that whatever your weakness is, somebody out there has a strength in that area. That's one of the reasons why um, Rodney is on my uh, on the board with Santa Story because he is a financial uh, guru and I am not. And he <laughs> helps me with the complex math. Yeah, so, uh, Ryan, do you, you have any comments you want to make with people trying to pitch their idea to you? And I know you gave me a hard time, so it's not too <laughs> Well, the, the biggest thing in my area is when you're pitching your idea, I may like it, I may not, but I'm going to look at it from does the financial make sense? In the path you're trying to take to get to this idea that I may like or I may not like. So I don't, it doesn't matter to me if I like it or not. But does it make financial sense? It looks like you've done your due diligence in trying to get uh, financing. You've got a plan for the next year, the next two years, the next three years, and you've got a contingency plan that's also going to help you. When you have that bubble in the room, yeah. you can't go to the room to get $100,000, $500,000 to get you to that next slide. And, and uh, Dan, that's why we uh, also, you know, in, in this competition with the startup world, since they, since they know you're building something and they may not be on the market yet, they, they want uh, to understand the revenue model, which is what, you know, Brian is talking about how do you make money because you know they just give it the sound. So you have to be able to articulate that, that revenue model. And then you do watch Shark Tank, and it always resonates with me. How do I get my money back yes. if I'm investing in it? Right. And if you can't articulate that to convince the person, you wasted their time in this. Yeah, and, and and so that's that's a bad you mentioned that how how do the, how does the investor get their get their money back mm -hmm. when you take on giving up some equity to, to take on investment? And so the, the question that you would get get asked in a pitch competition, what's your exit strategy? That's why that's that's what they're that's why they ask that question now because they're a big concern about how they <laughs> get their get their money back. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to tip like that and 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 um and so when I started pitching, you know, that question didn't make sense to me. And and so, but you know, even though you might have a great idea, and but like Rod was saying, if you don't have that revenue stuff um, fix it right, and that you can have the best idea in the world, but if you can't articulate to that investor how they're gonna get their money back, then it doesn't matter how good your idea is. So so you as a as a business owner get really excited. And you're an idea person, and you're like, oh, this is going to be fun, and we're going to change the world, and we're going to do all this stuff. And then you run into Rodney, and Rodney says, how, what you, what, how do you like this? How's this set work? How's that set work? And, and it, all of a sudden, but he's right. It's not a startup. It's a business. Yes. And if you so, Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that. So, um, so this is what people get confused about startups and startup ecosystem and entrepreneurial ecosystem. A startup is, is, is a somebody, an organization that's actually working on a business idea. And, and, and once they launch, you know, and, and, and get their, um, yeah, validate their revenue model, get that product, then they're a business. But, in, but in, while you're working on an idea, you're not really a business. Mm -hmm. and so that's, that's what people don't understand. What I see a lot of times is they don't realize people will help them before they form their business. And, and so that's hard. That's a hard lesson. So, like I tell people, I won. Um, uh, uh, I didn't form cognitive. Big, I came up with an idea for cognitive in 2014 in the spring, and I was one in It was a 200,000 dollars pitch competition. So that sort of motivated me to kind of get into it. But um, uh, and so I did enter. I hadn't formed a company yet. I, you know, had, had a partner, and I participated in a couple of programs, and and then I got invited to that 
uh, accelerator program over at Fort Walton. So um, they were giving up 25 grand to you know this my dear you know getting in the program you know which results in a twenty five thousand dollar funding and so that's when I, <laughs> that's when I formed the company yeah. because they, 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 they got a bank account yeah you see what I'm saying sure. so work you know so that's hard for people you know understand that you don't already have to have a storefront. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but if, if you if you talk to your buddy, your buddy is your buddy. The first thing he's going to say is, "I don't care about all the stuff." Yeah, I want to know how eventually. Mm -hmm. you know what else I'm going to do right off the bat? Is this going to be a business or is this not? Uh -huh. Some yeah. people know the difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they go up one street down to the Fox Market. It could be a business, yeah. but it very well could be just a hot yeah. But actually, the Cal Fox Market is a great place for you to test the water. It is. Uh, a food truck is it. less expensive than building a restaurant. It's uh, what we would love for everybody to do is to go test it. You know, you know write your book, put it in the trunk of your car, and go out and say, Rodney, what do you think about my book? I love your book. Okay, you want to spend $15? If he won't spend fifteen dollars with me, then maybe I got a problem. If I can't sell the book out of the trunk of my car, I certainly don't need to be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And I, that's I'm an idea guy, so it's really easy for me to come up with a hundred thousand ideas. Where Brian will be back on the okay, I need one. Yeah, and that's the purpose of the Star People system to to get you the mentors like Brian, um, you know, and, and get you uh, learn like you. Teaching how to how to um, um, pitch your idea, and that's what ecosystem is, is really all, all about. And and so so I'll say this and I'll shut up. Uh, so what I tell people, the minute you start working on your idea, so you, you got this idea, and now you're going to start figuring out a way, you know, to talk to people about it, you know, get the customer validation. But but the, the minute you start working on that idea, you are a founder. Mm -hmm. So, and so when you become a founder, then all these resources open up to you. Yeah. And, and so that's what that's what the problem, that's what the challenge is. You have to be working on something that that, that can scale out to a lot, a lot of people. When I say you, you all these resources, you can you can get uh, cloud space to ho host your website for free. You can. Uh, you can get people to help you with your uh, lean canvas, which is a one-page business plan. You can um, you can uh, recruit a co-founder to, to to do it, and then and so what, what we try to do with Start from the Blocks is we we pair, try to pair you up with all these resources, and, and so so you don't have to worry about all the funding that that's typically required, but you have to be working on something that's scale. And, and, and the, so like. They didn't do it this year, but it truly amazed me last year in the fall they announced a $2 million pitch competition for Black and Brown Fund. Wouldn't you have loved a better position to go for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, $2 million. Mm -hmm. First prize, $1 million, second prize, five. Of course, they at least take each competition they take equity. But most pitch competitions, they don't take any equity from the company. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, you know, free, un unrestricted funding. So, so it's just an opportunity to the Lord. And um, yeah, Dan, we thank you for coming. Um, we, we thank you for showing up. Sure, I didn't know until they came here and say anything. <laughs> yeah, but when you start these businesses and these startups, it's crucial from day one you start tracking any expenses you incur. Okay. And six months down the road, when you realize, oh, I, I think I'm ready to start making some money. Now you can't go back and recap everything you spent. I'm not talking about your time. I'm talking about the dollars you've invested in getting to where you're at the point now where you're ready to start making some money. So those are the startup costs for your business that you want to make sure that you make sense. And I find that as a difficulty in new businesses and small businesses everywhere. They don't realize that once you start spending money for this hobby slash business, hopefully business, you need to, that you want to expense every dollar that you want to spend. You don't want to waste it. 
Because you don't pay tax on that revenue. So you want to pay that tax on the money as long as possible. And those are the expenses that you spend on the cost of the All right. So, uh, Ben, any uh, final words before we uh, wrap it up? The number one thing that Rodney says to me, he doesn't say hello, he doesn't say hello today, he says, where's your receipt? <laughs> I, 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 when, I, when I think of Rodney, when he comes knocking, I say, here comes Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I would say is, thank, thank you everyone for being here, and uh, Lloyd has my information, so if I can help, I would love to help out, I'd love to chat with you all. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, if you email me the presentation, I'll, I'll make sure everybody um, Got it. gets it. Okay, we'll do. But yeah, I'm, I'm out there. I would love to answer questions, have coffee, whatever I can do to help. Yes, and, and so how do they get hold of you? And I'll, you, you can, if you've got something you want to say about that um, website or. Yeah, it's uh, Daniel Pennington at speaker-training.org. And love to hear from you. And uh, a website which is uh, www.speakertraining.org. And uh, but I'm, I'm really easy. I mean, you want to have go have coffee and talk about your specific idea. If you've got to do a pitch and you need a couple of hours of consultation, holler at me. Don't get in there and get lost and, and struggle. Okay? Yeah, and, and so, yeah. Have you been helping people out through Zoom or these other platforms? Yeah, yeah. I do as much through Zoom as I do anything else. We can do just a quick Zoom meeting if you'd like or send me an email send me a text message i am uh, available yeah so chris uh, this is uh chris hendricks he's our streaming partner for the folks on linkedin facebook this you know this, to this guy back to cola what's the name of Graf? what's yeah. the name of the other company you got graphic Vine media graphic Vine media so what pitch us tell us what graphic Vine media is <laughs> so graphic Vine media is a podcast and audio engineer our goal is to actually amplify your voice. So we are able to take your voice, take what you have as audio, take what you have as video, mash it together, send it out to the masses. We'll be having you syndicated around the world in 30 days of us. Now see if everybody can do that. <laughs> see, I wouldn't use the word mash, but apart from that, boy, it's beautiful. I got it. I know what this guy does, and you've been here for 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We thank everybody for coming. Thanks to folks all, all, online, and we appreciate it. Uh, again. Goodbye, everyone. Online. Well,